now with huge excitement i'm very very excited to be able to introduce our final panelists for today and um, we'll be wel welcoming back the beautiful amara spence and beautiful aisha shillingford for this last conversation of the day um amara and aisha will talk about their practices and projects at maya and that intelligent mischief they will discuss who inspires and informs their work about the Black imagination, their ancestry and cultural traditions, and the resonance of those things at this time. The session will close out the day with the energy and joy of possibility, alongside a rigor and perspective on what it means to truly practice resource and make space for this work. Um, over to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited because I know that people have been rocking with this whole convening like all day but the honor of like sitting here and kicking it with you I'm like no no <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with you how are you me too um I'm I'm really excited to be in this conversation yeah I can't wait <laughs> Yes. Um, and I feel like I'm particularly excited as someone who has been following your work for a really long time. And um I guess I'm just, yeah, I feel bubbly, but I'm like, we have half an hour together and there's so much to talk about. So yeah, how are you in this moment and where do you want to start? Yeah, um, I'm doing well. Today is an interesting day in general. Um, I'm at I, I've been at this festival at South by Southwest for the past week. And today I'm starting to feel like a little overwhelmed with like every, you know, like everything that's going on. Like it's such a vast um, and deep, you know, place in terms of just the sheer number of people and offerings and like different ways of approaching creativity. So I'm feeling really um, happy to just be grounding in this conversation that's that's what it feels like it's kind of like tapping back into like something at the root um that isn't like so exactly present in this festival um yes yeah, so I'm feeling I'm feeling calmer already just being here how about you how are you doing I'm okay I'm I'm at home where it's an interesting time to be in England where there are like strikes of every kind imaginable. Um, like workers are striking up and down the country. So it means like at any given moment, it's like, oh, my kids aren't at school. Oh, mm -hmm. there's no public transport. So I'm here with my kids. One of them is ill. So it's like, uh, uh, uh. and then it was like, I did my Googles. And I was like, Aisha Shillingford is from Trinidad and Tobago. What? Cassie Robinson has brought two Caribbean people to close <laughs> up a conversation about world building. Oh my God. So then I got really excited. So I was like, I don't think they knew what they were doing, but they do, but they do. <laughs> I feel like this is this is a this is something that I have no doubt we're gonna come back to. Um but yeah, I I was well, you kind of noticed that both of our organizations started in. 2013 so I'm going to throw back your question to you um, <laughs> what do you feel like what was happening for you at that time and um, what were you noticing what were you proximate to um, that mm -hmm. led you to starting Intelligent Mischief yeah that yeah thank you um so I'll say that I actually wasn't at personally at Intelligent Mischief at the time that it was founded my partner founded it in 2013 um, and he founded it, he, like myself, had been a longtime community organizer, um, you know, sort of working in social justice, um, social justice, labor, um, environmental justice organizations for a long time. And I think it was a combination of both a personal desire to be more integrated, like we both had felt that we were sort of needing to like hide our creative sides and hide the parts of ourselves that were artists and creatives and like, you know, kind of like thinking far outside the box of social justice organizations at the time. So that's kind of why he founded it. And then on the other hand, he wanted to create a separate space that his friends who were organizers and movement builders could go to, to try out the ideas that their organizations wouldn't let them try. And some of that came from 
you know, like he was working on a healthcare campaign and he had this idea. It was a healthcare campaign uh, through um, the SEIU, which is a labor union. And they were trying to engage young people into the healthcare campaign. And he had the idea of doing like a poetry series across um, the state. He was in, in New York at the time. And they did that series. It was extremely effective, got a lot of young people signed up to join the union and participate in that campaign. And then at the end, his boss was like, okay, that was a cool diversion. Now get back to the real organizing. Mm -hmm. So I think he just realized that there wasn't enough space for really bringing creativity and imagination and new forms of organizing. And so he wanted to create this, this separate space at the time. Mm. I resonate with so much of that even as I was kind of listening to some of the talks earlier today um, there's something that always feels like the thing that we don't get to talk about when we think about art and culture and creativity is it's more than about making people feel good or you know it's more than well-being and those things are important but also there's something that's incredibly capacious and you know the, the thing about the thing about art for me is it helps give a materiality and a form and context to ideas and it gives layers mm -hmm. and we rehearse those layers together. I was talking about that before. And I was really interested in how then can we as artists or people who know that we want to work with art, can we build liberation? Can we set that mm -hmm. as the thing that we want to create and what would that look like and what does it take? And if we see then the world as a rehearsal room, you know, mm. how do we then organize? How do we then prototype? How then do we start to mm. um, experience our work as we're building it? But I definitely, I started Maya very naively, um, but because I couldn't access opportunity, I couldn't, you know, I was working as an artist in an ensemble theater company. Um, and I've said this before, but my mom basically said, uh, you're either going to have to go to university or you're going to have to pay the council tax bill. And I was mm -hmm. like, I'm going to university. then, <laughs> And I ended up um, sort of moving out and then being inundated with bills anyway. But I said, I only want to go to university if I can do what I love. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, I went through university and I didn't get what I was hoping to get. There was how do you sustain this as a livelihood? How do you have a how do you have a career? You know, how do you build a livelihood um, mm -hmm. from creative practice? And after university, um, I connected with my my best friend, Amber, who had also recently graduated at that time. And we were like, I think there are people like us who can't access opportunity, who can't get their way in. We keep trying to, you know, make connections with people in these buildings, in the venues, in the, in the institutions. And it's not happening in a way that feels like we're valued or cared for mm -hmm. in any way. Um, that's if we can even get in the building. So we were like, I think there's, I think there's a role to play for us understanding people like us, artists like us, people that don't yet feel comfortable to call themselves artists, but maybe mm -hmm. they might. Like, what would we build? What do we want to imagine for ourselves? And how do we want to equip mm -hmm. ourselves to do that? And I got really excited by um then not looking at like the cultural sector for the the precedence for what we want to build like I couldn't look at the creative industries and say oh that's what we want to model it from I had to look elsewhere I come from a line of like educators who um who weren't working in official settings they were working in youth centers and community centers around the around the city and I was like I want to I want to tend to people and build relationships the way that they do I want to I want to cultivate spaces that feel like what it's like to be at my Nana's house or to be with my granddad's, my granddad's kitchen. Can we start to build infrastructure from that spirit? But that led me to a heck of a load of questions um, because it was also like, well, then from a systems perspective, what do you come up against when you try to create mm. your own path? And mm -hmm. it's really interesting even hearing you talk about the origins of intelligent mischief and that relationship between labor organizing and building youth capacity. I'm interested in, in Aisha Schillingford's story in this, in this wider work as well. Like what, what do you feel, like what are parts of your origin story or what are the parts for you personally mm -hmm. that feel like when you're thinking about imagination work, what led you to this? Yeah, 
I feel like that kind of connects to the um the Caribbean roots a little bit. Um, you know, when I look back at my greatest influences are each of my parents, you know, like my mom and my stepfather. And my stepfather, he, you know, I grew up in Trinidad and my stepfather, he was the first in his um, family to finish elementary school, even, you know, like his mother didn't have a chance to go to go beyond, um, you know, primary school. And, um, you know, he went on to get a PhD and he was like, he was an economist. He's a, he's a labor economist. Um, and so his whole work was dedicated to uh, sort of creating opportunity, economic opportunities for poor Black folks in Trinidad. And then my mom, on the other hand, was always like, she's an artist. She, you know, was always playing carnival. Like she was um, a member of Derek Walcott's uh, theater company. She's an actor, producer, director. And so that her world was, you know, like I would always think like my dad's friends are the ones who talk politics and my mom's friends are like the beautiful like people, like they're just glamorous and like famous and on TV all the time. Um, and my dad really shaped a lot of the work that I had, that I did, you know, like he, I worked for his um, consulting company, it was a development consultancy in the Caribbean, sort of, you know, doing a lot of work around watershed development and um, you know, poverty alleviation and so on. And, um, you know, he sort of put me on this path. I, I went to school to study environmental um, policy, and then I did a master's in social work, um, and then did an MBA in social innovation. So that was, you know, I was so shaped by my father, and he was very intentionally shaping me. And then around 2014, I was living in a cooperative house in um, in Boston, and all of my roommates were artists. And I, it, I think just being around all of them, um, they, you know, some of them were to art school, some of them had finished art school. Um, we had started hosting like a, a show, a gallery show in our house um, where they would, they would do calls for art and then people around the country would like mail in their pieces and we'd do a show. And it was just like a, you know, a, a very, um, you know, an inspiring kind of uh, place to live. And I started, feeling like that part of me come alive, the part of me that was like shaped by being around my mom. Um, and I remember in, in about uh, 2014, I was really craving like, you know, practicing art, making art, being around more creative people. And that's when I kind of met um, Intelligent Mischief and was like, oh my gosh, these folks are sort of bridging these two parts um, in this really unique, like mischievous, like trickster, way that like uh feels very much like carnival and feels like the stuff my mom was doing but has this vision and purpose that was like in alignment with my dad's or you know a pan-african lens a global lens a, uh you know development liberation lens and i was like oh this is like really kind of a perfect um mix and um you know in that space eventually got to like claim uh, the word term artist for myself as well and develop an artistic practice um, and really starting to like hone in on like, how do we like preserve for ourselves like spaces of freedom and play and like, you know, thinking outside the box um, and, and still be in, um, you know, sort of fidelity to this long-term goal and this big, bold vision and, you know, um, things like that. And yeah, <laughs> that, that's sort of the like circuitous path. <laughs> I love this. And also your parents sound lit. Because, <laughs> but that also makes sense because I feel like there's such an expansiveness in, in your artistic practice. And it's interesting to hear that you kind of came to, like came to articulate that for yourself through the work. Because the one thing I love about your, your, your collage work is stunning. And I feel like that's something that it travels really far. And, you know, like I see it come up, like my partner shares it sometimes and he would consider himself like completely disconnected from this work. And like my friends, my colleagues, people in the field, like that your visual collage work is so stunning and so um poignant and expansive and I'll never forget there was there was one post um and it and it stumped me for weeks and I keep coming back to it there's a there's a post that you shared and you said what if black um black imagination was synonymous with freedom 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, child, no, oh, damn. Because <laughs> so much, you know, we talk a lot about um, Black imagination. We speak so much about it. We, we practice from Black imagination as like a guiding principle. But that for me shifted something. And it, and it made me ask, like, if 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 it was synonymous with freedom, then I think we would have to, as a society, take Black imagination so much more seriously than we actually mm. do and, and, and remove it from black people like I, so I was in a coffee shop a couple of weeks ago right and I overheard someone who was speaking about Maya and um they didn't know I was there that I take it they, they didn't know I had anything to do with it um, and they were saying oh you know like they do black imagination stuff and I feel like it's so limited because then they're not open to other people's perspectives and I was like I don't know what you think black imagination is but this is about this is about more than individual this is about more than singular perspectives it is the expansiveness and and going back to that sort of you know the sort of the blackness is not synonymous with in individuals or it's it's about more than identity and all of these things and I feel like when I saw this post from from intelligent mischief I was like black imagination was synonymous with freedom we have to bust the door wide open on what we really (laughs) think freedom actually is and Mm. whose imagination actually matters I just wanted to thank you for that in person now that we're here but I'm really curious as to how you work and in particular what feels present for you when you're thinking about imagination or imagination infrastructure and the Mm -hmm. sort of verb of that the infrastructuring of it what feels Mm -hmm. alive for you what feels present for you as you're working Mm -hmm. yeah and I'm obviously definitely curious um, to hear the same from you because I was really struck when I was um, reading about this conference and the work of of the Joseph Rancher Foundation and your work I was like oh my gosh it feels like a totally uh, different context and some of that is like the the words that are used to describe similar things and some of it feels like ooh like some things uh don't exist it feels like it doesn't exist here in the same way in in the US um you know when we first started doing this this kind of arena of unleashing what we call unleashing black imagination we thought we wanted to um, create spaces for Black folks to imagine. And we started doing that actually at the beginning of the pandemic when it felt like both there was so much uncertainty uncertainty, and it was sort of like the I, maybe the peak of an arc of, you know, folks sort of feeling like we're in the midst of some kind of like turning or transition of society. And we have no idea what's coming next because there's so much short-termism that we've been trained into um, so that even when, you know, regular discourse about the future is only thinking about five or 10 years because I think it's being trained by, you know, by the financial system, but like futures means two years, four years, 10 years maybe. Um, And we wanted to create this space where people could come and engage in world building and really sort of leap way far forward into the future and really um, kind of remove the um, obstacles to imagining that happen when you see all of these um, forces sort of like restricting you um, in day-to-day life. And so we started doing these world building sessions and we were like, okay, this is what we do. We create space for people um, to imagine. And then, you know, we were, in a learning orientation around that and realizing that um, the amount of of imagination that exists that is um, restricted by the way systems work, people, we couldn't possibly invite everyone into a world building session to unleash that imagination. And also that, you know, coming into a session to engage in um, world building and storytelling just isn't for everyone. Um, And so we wanted, to sort of uh, create other opportunities. And to be honest, we were kind of inspired a little bit by people's response to the Black Panther film, the first one, um, where we ran a little survey and found out that um, the people who responded had seen the film on average like six times. And we were like, there's something there about why are people going to sit in this film six times? And we are like, we think they want to be immersed in that world, even if it's just for three hours. And 
um, we felt that, okay, we need to have this, this sort of methodology where we um, create stories and sort of unleash imagination in order to build worlds. Uh, and then we need to make these worlds available to other people who might not come to our workshops or, you know, they may not have the time or the inclination or it's not their thing, but they can like see a piece of art, you know, and our ideal like desires for like art to be public art, um, you know, so that it is accessible and that people can sort of happen upon it, um, you know, sort of walking down the street or something and sort of experience that kind of like, whoa, like I never thought about that thing before, or I've never seen this image before. And because I saw it, or I engaged with this question, now I, now this thing is possible, um, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then all the way to immersive experiences where we um, sort of curate these spaces where people can literally like put their bodies inside of and be like, I'm inside of a world that is sort of stretching my assumptions about what's possible. Uh, for people like me and so on. Um, and then I just noticed that that was happening sort of fractally that like, as I'm sort of like engaging with how do I create spaces for people that like my own art making was also doing like this world building. Um, and that, you know, some of that was just allowing myself to like channel um, these visions and these spaces um, that kind of posit or prefigure like, um, you know, freedom and relaxation and like, um, you know, some opacity, um, you know, the ability to like not be surveilled and completely just read um, all the time. And also like one thing that I'm incorporating into that work is like, um, you know, like that we can have whatever emotions we want. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, black joy. And like, everyone's like really smiling. Like maybe I can just be contemplative or I can be like, a little bit like mellow, you know, like I can be in dream space. Like there's no expectation of yeah. the, you know, the behaviors of people in this world. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm so curious about how y'all are doing uh, and approaching imagination infrastructure because I want to learn from, from what y'all have going on too. I feel like there's some, there's some like synchronous sort of learning that we're all actually doing by osmosis even if like mm. we don't know each other this is the first time that we've spent time together but I know that your work has so informed mine and we share some relationships with people like Tony Patrick and you know mm. incredible people who there's something that's happening those murmurations feel really present and even when you were talking about art making and it's almost like that your art is is creating these portals for us to travel through through and mm. in and out of time with there's something about your work in particular that I'm like, that aligns with how we think about our more than human accountabilities. Um, mm -hmm. Because when we think about the more than human, we think about plant life and, and animal beings and our kin and the water and the elements as much as we think about our ancestors, the people who were here before, the people who are still present with us now in other paradigms, the people who have yet to come, the people who aren't considered human in our current paradigm. Like, how can we bring all of this into our very being so that when we think about who we're accountable to and what the more than human is, we're practicing all of that. And that feels so alive in, in your work, in the, in the projects that you build, in the worlds that you build, and also that, and how art provides almost like an introduction into those spaces um, and you also talked about thank you so much for bringing play and cinema um, into this because for me I always feel like those were my introductions to welding world making world understanding design spatial politics I always say that um, uh, John Singleton films were the first films that I watched and was like now I understand when my uncles are at my granddad's table talk like reasoning and talking about the system, the systems trying to this, that and the other. John Singleton films helped me understand spatial politics in real time, in humor, in black love, in, you know, um, Lawrence Fishburne standing on the mountaintop in South Central Los Angeles and talking about gentrification. I was like, I'm understanding the layers of what my uncles and my aunties are reasoning about 
So it was impossible for me to not grow up with a systems analysis. I'm a child of, of Hansworth in the UK, which has been a pivotal place in race relations here. Um, so all of this shaped my work, but I was a big gamer when I was a kid, like huge um, into my teens. I loved GTA, um, which I don't really get to say <laughs> often, but GTA on the basis of, I started to build my own maps, trying to copy yeah. GTA maps. And then I started to imagine the, the social infrastructure that would need to exist in those cities that I was designing. Then I started to imagine like the characters that lived in those cities and how the infrastructure was working. I didn't have the language that, that I use now, but I started to like map this out and grow so that when I came into theatre and I fell in love with set design and story, and it's that same immersion that you were talking about, theatre felt like an introduction to immerse in all of the things that I was interested in. But gaming and play was my first sort of like, this feels good in my body and mm -hmm. I love the fact that there's something that I think that you're that you're doing and I don't even know how conscious you are that when you are making and when you are building you were you were similarly creating that same capacity for us to be present in our bodies and feel mm -hmm. all of the things that come with that if it is mellow if it is joy you know if it is um complicity if it is comfort if it is like you know meh whatever it is that we have the space to do that so I got into the built environment I got into building physical form because I said how do we create that same something for for us how do we create that so black people can be safe what does it take for us to be how a whole selves if it means if it means I'm vexed and I'm angry and I want to and I want a safe space to feel that then I feel that. Um, and it was impossible for us to do that without thinking about how do we not escalate gentrification? How do we not, you know, recreate the same structures of dominance and hierarchy that we're all um, crushed under the weight of? How do we not do that? Um, I'm conscious of the time we're like running now, we're just getting into it. <laughs> But it felt like for us, the first thing that we had to do was, you know, we don't come from money. We don't come from wealth in order for us to organize and say, what does it take to acquire a space that is going to require more money, more capital that we have? Um, mm -hmm. We had to hold the line and say, we're not going to get distracted by developers who really like our vision and want to offer mm -hmm. us something that doesn't sit in alignment with our integrity. Um, so we were like, we were either going to buy it or we're going to have the building on a really, really long lease that, mm -hmm. that would be able to support generations. When we buy the land, we'll put it in some protective mechanism with a covenant, like mm -hmm. a community land trust, so that the community are holding the value of it, um, not a singular um, sort of entity. And mm -hmm. that what we actually have to practice is like, how do we tend to relationships? So if we're thinking about, you know, the, the idea of practicing the world into being, then we have to practice at every scale. What are the types of relationships and spaces that even make that possible? So the first thing we did was we had to build prototypes. So we have a space um, called Yard because we wanted it to feel like Yard. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We wanted it to feel like Nan and Granda's house. We wanted it to feel like our parents' house. And we said, can we use this physical site as the place where we get to practice into being the infrastructure that we're imagining? But I feel like that's what you do beautifully virtually at the same time Farah's here <laughs> <laughs> um I just want to thank you Aisha because your work has um I feel like it's changed the game and it's continuing to evolve and to bring us in and I feel like we're all in this mode of sort of time travel and different mm. temporalities in real time um so I just give all of my gratitude to the work that you're growing and and building and thank you for being who you are thank you Omar it's been such a pleasure I can't wait to continue getting to know you and your work and honestly in my mind I'm already like okay how can I arrange a visit <laughs> um, yeah we're gonna we're gonna hook it up we're gonna hook it up <laughs> we're gonna hook it up thank you so much thank you uh, thank you both so much and how awful to be the face that has to cut off those conversations because that's definitely not something I want to do um I don't want to speak for very long but I just love how um you guys both you both shared about how your your families were spaces where you transitioned into different worlds and then how you use that to now create new worlds for others and how powerful that is um, and it's something I really relate to as well um Thank you so much for closing us and bringing us home so beautifully. Um, this is not the end. This is just another a stage of the journey. Um, and these conversations will continue. 
Um, I'm going to hand back to Cassie, Carrie, and Gabriella, who opened the day with their ambitions and hopes for this event, and will share a few reflections on where where this has landed for them. All that was later. Um, so over to you three. Thanks, Farah. Um, yeah, so I I've got some thank yous to do, but I think before that. Um, yeah, it'd be really good to hear both from Kerry and Gabriella. I mean, thank you to Amara and Aisha for that last session. I was so glad when Aisha said yes and Amara said yes, that they would sort of round out the day um, and bring some of their kind of beautiful energy, um, yeah, to, to end things. But hopefully it isn't the end. And Amara will find a way to get Aisha over here. <laughs> Don't you worry. Um, and yeah, so it's been such a full day. I, I've got so many things that I need to look back on and watch again and read. And there's been so much generosity in the chat, so many links shared um, and reflections. Um, Kerry, Gabriella, how are you feeling? And what are your final reflections? Um, well, I loved today, and I think, um, as you said, there's a lot, there's a lot of food. It feels like a day when we've been fed and we've got a lot to take away. Um, I suppose I have a few things that, that that stay with me. The first is probably Sophie's comment first thing in the morning, that in the current time, an idea is like a hot potato and you shouldn't be left holding it at the, at the end of a crisis. You should be sharing it. And it was lovely to see the generosity of everybody in the chat um, sharing everything. Um, the second thing that really came up for me today was the relationship between emotion and affect and bodies and imagination. Um, and I was really struck by the by Amara's statement, I want to build an infrastructure that feels like my granddad's home. And that ties into me with a conversation around safety and risk and the relationship between those two things that came up in the conversation with um, Arturo and Vlad. Um, I was also really interested in Vanessa's invitation to self-awareness, to notice what's pulling and pushing at our perception of, of what is possible and her uh, request to do the work on yourself so you don't create work for other people. That continues to be, I think, a mantra that's useful here. Um, so this question about embodied reflection, immersive creativity, going into something, going deep and going horizontal, going into the body and, and into the mind and, and thinking about how these relate. But the last point, this last conversation also really triggered for me something that I don't think we've covered this time and uh, invites um, a follow up. <laughs> which is around the, 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 the kind of economics of the imagination infrastructure and how we start to be as imaginative with our economic practices as we are with everything else. And how do we create the economic practices that will allow the creation of spaces for convening, for collective work, for collective thinking. And I think um, the, the session on the civic imagination to me really pointed to some really powerful directions there. So I'm so grateful to everybody and to you, Cassie, for inviting us to be part of this conversation and to the team behind the scenes who've done an amazing job and all the speakers. So thank you. And on my end, I think the richness of this conversation started way before today. So this is a very layered sense of both exhaustion today, but mostly exhilaration after such a full, full day. Uh, so first of all, just like Cassie, your generosity in every sense of convening, of knowing how to spur on conversations, of adding Carrie and myself to this layer is absolutely fantastic. One of the things that also strikes a chord and that I think this was a really interesting catapult, if you will, for the things to come is, um, as you and I have spoken about before, Cassie, you know, we, the three of us have been, you know, pushing the importance of imagination for more than a decade now. And it seems, as you well said in the morning, that it's time has come. So perhaps when a word catches fire, I find it's also a really interesting space to make to start making substance out of it because things can very easily become a buzzword and we can throw imagination here and there. And then instead of gathering traction and power and soul and depth, 
it becomes more of its surface value. So my feeling that I'm left with today is that there's so much traction and so much momentum. And the question of how to resource that, what that infrastructure for the people that are building infrastructure actually means. So it's very much like a meta infrastructure that I think um, is such a beautiful thing to, to be thinking about and the social structuring of that, because I do think especially in challenging times that being connected and having deep conversations and be willing to struggle together um, with all of the tensions that are involved with generosity, I think is perhaps one of the most interesting things that we could be thinking about in, in many, many ways. And so what I really liked about today, because I think um, Carrie did a wonderful job of sum summarizing sub several of the points, so I'll just like be broad because besides my brain is still on Bogota mode, so I'm <laughs> besides a full day, I'm also on jet lag mode. I think one of the most important lessons for me today is how interesting it is when people bring their passion and their politics but also their curiosity and their imagination, because this is what makes it a generous space. I think it's a very divisive society. I think it's very easy nowadays, politically, socially, in so many ways to be throwing and slinging things at each other. But I actually think that there's a need to really stay together to figure things out. Um, everything perfectible, most certainly. But again, passion, politics, and also curiosity and imagination in each of the conversations. So. Carrie, it's been such a joy to be able to think together with you. Um, I really enjoyed all of the speakers. And as you all said, there's a fantastic team in the background. That is the other infrastructure without that, the infrastructure of care, actually. Um, without, we, we could not have done it without you. So thank you, everybody um, that has been in the background for this. And thank you all. Like these 75 people should get a diploma. <laughs> basically of stamina and uh so thank you to everybody that's been out there and your generous comments and i'm hoping that this will be the, of many the start of many things to come yeah thank you uh, yeah it's been really interesting seeing the numbers go up and down throughout the day and there's probably like this hardcore core that have just lasted it out which is really impressive um yeah so i i really just want to finish up by saying um I mean, firstly, please do make sure to connect into the community of practice. Like, you know, we really want that to be a space where the practice can grow and develop and spread and be resourced. Um, and yeah, first of all, thank you so much to Iris and Birch and the team. So there's Mona and Ellie and Johannes and Rachel who have just been doing an amazing job. Um, I hope that that is the whole team. Um, yeah, like they they have looked after it so well and we've, we've barely had to do anything. It's been incredibly seamless. Um, so thank you. Um, I, th I feel like you should all come on and say hello in a minute and or at least at least show your faces if you can and wave goodbye. Um, so you're not completely invisible. Care should not. We need to visibilize care. <laughs> and uh, that that is you and the team. Um, and then also Eleanor and Seppi um, from, from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who are like part of the Emerging Futures team. They've also been doing an amazing job. Um, um, and Martin from JRF, who's who's done some last minute design things. He's, he's not here, but I really want to acknowledge him. Um, and like just more broadly with Joseph Roundtree Foundation, as I said at the beginning, like it is amazing that an organization that is also working so hard on the current immediate crises um, to highlight issues, uh, to be focusing on things like the budget and trying to hold the government to account can also resource a space like this and recognizing the need for that. And people like Sophia, um, who's the director of Emerging Futures, like really helping to make that happen. Um, so I wanna make sure they all get a shout out and an acknowledgement. And then Farah, um, who, you know, has done such a beautiful job of holding the space, um, doing summarizing. Um, yeah, everyone's saying how amazing you are in the chat. Um, she is also a JRF trustee, which I think is very lucky for JRF. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you so much for holding it as you have all day. Um, 
I think that's everyone. I hope I've said thanks to everyone. And then obviously, lastly, Kerry and Gabriella. Um, you know, like there's been so many comments on how amazing the curation's been. And I maybe suggested a couple of people like you really have curated the whole thing um, and really helped frame the sessions, come up with the themes um, and brought a much richer and broader perspective than I would ever have been able to do, especially like an international one. Um, some of the more academic like we wouldn't have got that there's some there's there's some people that we had to come and speak here who were down to you and your networks and the relationships and respect that you, that you have um across the world so thank you so much um yeah and we'll be sharing everything afterwards um because there's so much to digest um and I hope everyone has a lovely rest of evening um yeah I think that's it